Welcome back to 100 Days of Logic with Carnegie.org. Today we're going to be continuing with propositional logic, looking at the answers to the problems on the conditional proof that we looked at in the last video. If you haven't checked out those problems already, here they are. Your task is to get from the premises to the conclusion using the 18 rules of inference and conditional proof. If you want to try this on your own, pause the video right here. But if you already have the answers, or you just want to see what the answers are, follow me and let's get started. So, the first one was premise 1, P implies Q, premise 2, P implies R, and we want to conclude P implies Q and R. This seems extremely intuitive, and it might not be that hard to just prove with the 18 rules of inference, but in order to practice our conditional proof, we're going to do it that way. So, the first part of our conclusion, the antecedent of that implication, is P. So, we're going to want to assume, in our assumed conditional proof, P. We'll write ACP and we'll draw a line going down. Then, we're just going to get to Q and R pretty easily through premise 1, 3, modus ponens to get Q, and premise 2, 3, modus ponens to get R. Therefore, we can then conjoin Q and R, premise 4, premise 5, conjunction, and get the consequent of our implication so that we can conclude P implies Q and R from premise 3 through 6 conditional proof. Note, the first part of the implication is what we assumed starting in with, and the second part of that implication is what we ended up with in that assumed conditional proof. That's the way these things work. Let's take a look at our next example. We have P or Q implies R and S, S or T implies U and W, and what we want to conclude is P implies W. In this problem, there's a lot of extraneous variables that are trying to confuse us or get in our way, but it's actually, when it comes down to it, going to just be a lot of simple addition and simplification. Let's take a look. So, of course, because the antecedent of our conclusion is P, what we're going to want to assume with our conditional proof is P. We'll write P and assume conditional proof, A, C, P, and we'll draw our line going down. Now, P on its own isn't very much used to us with those first two premises. What we need is P or Q. Fortunately, we can use addition to get that. We'll just add in Q, premise 3, addition, to get P or Q. We'll then use modus ponens to get R and S, premise 1, 4, modus ponens. R and S isn't going to be useful to us, but S or T will be. So we need to simplify this down to S and then add on S or T, premise 6, addition. We can then use S or T to get U and W, which we will do. Premise 2, premise 7, modus ponens. And finally, because we don't need that U, we only want the W, we'll simplify it down to just W. Premise 8, simplification. Now we walked into this assumed conditional proof with P, and we're walking out with W, so we're allowed to conclude P implies W from premises 3 through 9 conditional proof. Not that hard. Like I said, a lot of extraneous little simplifications and additions you have to throw in there, but nothing that I feel is conceptually too difficult. Let's take a look at something a little bit harder. We have P implies, Q implies R, P implies, S implies not T, and T implies Q or S. Here, I would strongly advise using two conditional proofs. Why? Because the conclusion we want has P implies T implies R. When there's that double implication in there, you're going to want to use two conditional proofs. You might not have to, but I think it's going to be easier. So, first off, we're going to assume P, because that's the first part of that conditional, and draw our line going down. Now, what we're going to do next is assume T, because that's the next part of our conditional. That's the next antecedent of that smaller conditional that T implies R in there. And once again, we'll draw a line going down to kind of separate off this part of the proof. Next, what we're going to do is do a bunch of modus ponens on the first three premises to get those conclusions, because we have P and T. We can get Q implies R from one four modus ponens, we can get S implies not T from two four modus ponens, and we can get Q or S from three five modus ponens. Now we have a lot of new things that we can work with, but unfortunately there's not that much we can do right now because we don't have a Q, we don't have an S, we don't have an R. The only thing we do have is that T in premise 5, which we can use with premise 7. So we'll get not not T from premise 5, double negation. We'll then run that back up premise 7 with a modus tollens to get not S. We'll use that not S to get Q from 8, 10 disjunctive syllogism, and we'll use Q to get R from 6, 11 modus ponens. Once we have R, all it is is a matter of getting out of these conditional proofs again, so we will 
jump out of that first bracket to get T implies R. Remember, we walked in assuming T and we came out with R. So we're allowed to conclude T implies R from 5 through 12 conditional proof. And then we can walk out of our final assume conditional proof and get P implies T implies R premise 4 through 13 conditional proof, which was the conclusion we were looking for all along. Now for something a little bit even more difficult. We have premise one, P implies, Q or R implies S and T. Premise two, T or U implies W. And we're trying to conclude P implies, R implies W. Once again, it's kind of that double conditional. So we're probably going to be thinking we're going to do two conditional proofs inside this proof. Let's take a look. First, what we should assume, because the beginning of the conclusion is P. Assume conditional proof, and we'll draw our line going down. Now, what we're going to do, we could go ahead and assume R. What I'm going to do is, because that first premise is so right for the modus ponens-ing, I'm going to just go ahead and use modus ponens on it right away, and get Q or R implies S and T from 1, 3 modus ponens. Now, I'm going to go ahead and assume R. Assume conditional proof, because that's the antecedent of that kind of second part of our conclusion. And we'll draw our line going down again. Now, R on its own isn't very useful to us. Q or R, however, would be. So we'll do an addition to add on that Q and then a commutativity to switch them around to get exactly that antecedent of that implication up in premise 4. Then we will run that through the implication to get S and T for 7 modus ponens. And then we're going to simplify that down because the S isn't really going to be very useful for us anywhere else in these premises. However, the T will be helpful for premise 2. So we'll simplify it down to T, we'll add on a U, and finally be able to do modus ponens to conclude W. Here we walked in with R and we're walking out with W, so we can conclude R implies W from 5 through 11 conditional proof. In this one we walked in with a P and we walked out with an R implies W, so we can Conclude, P implies, R implies, W, premise 3 through 12, conditional proof. That was all of the answers to the problems I just presented on conditional proof. If you want a special challenge, these problems should, I believe, be able to be solved just using the 18 rules of inference. Conditional proof is just an extra thing on top. If you can show me a proof that solves these problems using only the 18 rules of inference, I haven't done it, I'm not even sure it's possible, I will feature it in the next video, or in a future video. Next up, we're going to be doing another tool or technique called indirect proof, and some problems related to that. Watch a new video every single day for 100 days here at Carnegie.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.